over 25 years. I stopped counting at 25. I started feeling a little bit old. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm a cognitive psychology geek, um, which I think a lot of you probably know already. But one thing that you probably don't know uh, is that I'm also a bit of a fish geek. So uh, unfortunately, I'm really sorry, there are going to be no fluffy kittens in my talk. I'm actually allergic to cats. Um, but there will be some fish. So I've named this talk after this quote that is generally accredited to Einstein, but nobody's actually really very sure if Einstein ever said it or wrote it down, and I haven't found any definite evidence that it was Einstein, um, which is that actually everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, then it will live its whole, world, uh, its whole life believing that it's stupid. And most often we tend to see this quote being used to talk about the educational system, about the fact that the educational system kind of like with standardized testing more and more and all that kind of stuff, seems to be very homogenized, seems to want everybody to behave, act, learn in the same kind of way. Um, but I've included this quote because I think that that could probably be equally relevant to our workplaces. So I'm going to tell you my story a little bit first and pull out some strands about neurodiversity um, and homogenous culture for me. So I've got a background in IT. I um, graduated um, in um, information systems with, in French, bizarrely, but, um, and I went straight into the IT industry. And I'm a logic girl, right? I love delineation, probably a little bit too much. I like things to be nice and linear. Um, and I've always found people to be a little bit messy and confusing, if I'm completely honest about it. So, um, so I think, oh, you know, the IT industry is great for me. Um, and by the late 90s, I'm working for IBM. I've been a programmer. I've been a, a designer. I've been a systems analyst, a business analyst. Eventually, I'm a project manager. Um, and I have my appraisal with uh, my manager at the time which is generally really glowing. And then right at the end, he says something really strange. He says to me, I don't think you're going to stay at IBM all that long, though, because you're not an IBM kind of a person. Whoa. I was like, I don't even know what that means. At the time, OK, so now, in retrospect, I've got a pretty good idea why that might have been, right? I'm no interest at all in office politics. I have a flagrant and ongoing lack of respect for hierarchy. Um, so apologies to anybody who's ever been my manager. Um, but at the time, I thought, oh, no, I'm not, that must be about how I present myself. And I kid you not, I spent the next two years going into work every day in a shirt and tie. I really did. It was quite a good look, to be honest. Um, OK, so eventually I got so disenfranchised with IT that I had a major career change. I have to say, project manager probably wasn't the job for me anyway. Um, it played to all my linear, fact-based, people are messy stuff. I was pretty much queen of the Gantt chart. Um, so I got disenfranchised. I ran away. I ran away from IT. Um, I ran, left the country, and I trained to become a scuba diving instructor. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I still love diving. I did that for about three years. I traveled around the world. I lived in lots of beautiful places. And um, I dived a lot. I clocked up probably about 600 dives. And then something really weird happened one day. I was sitting in a dive center on a beautiful island, thinking about the fact that we have a number of dive boats and a number of dive sites and different customers every day. And the dive sites that you can dive are quite dependent on the weather, whether you can get to them or not. They're quite dependent on how tricky they are to dive, like how good a diver you are, how well qualified you are, how deep you're allowed to go. Um, and they're dependent about who's going with you. Like, do you need an instructor? Is a dive master OK? Um, so we've got all of those things mixed, in, mixed into what actually is a pretty classic kind of scheduling problem, right? And I find myself on this beautiful island doing a dream job um, that I absolutely adore on the back of little bits of paper designing a computer system that nobody is ever going to make to solve the scheduling problem. And right at that moment, I look up and I think to myself, Oh, shit, I'm going to have to go back. 
because there's a part of my brain that loves the logic stuff so much, I had to go back and, and feed it. So I went back and um, I decided that I wanted to do some, some stringent research and start a PhD. And pretty much one of the first things that I saw when I came back was on the front page of, I think it was Computer Weekly, it might have been computing. On the front page of Computer Weekly, there was a, a, a photo and an article about how extreme programming was being used at a big online bank um, in the UK. And I read the article and I thought, wow, this is totally my stuff. This is lots of things that I really, really enjoyed that I thought really, really worked on teams that I've worked on before, plus some other cool stuff that I haven't even tried. I need to find out about this. And because I was a logic girl, I thought the way to find out about this is to go and analyze lots of teams that are doing it. Right? And because I'm a logic girl, I thought, well, the best way to analyze the teams that are doing it is to record what they say to each other, cut it all up into lots of bits, uh, make loads of charts. Right? So I, I recorded, transcribed, and analyzed 14,866 sentences of pair programmer dialogue. I didn't even think I was autistic at the time either. Um, so, so I'm a logic girl, right? And, and, and I had some findings, some of which kind of counted what people were saying about pair programming at the time. And so I went and started presenting those at conferences. So here I am in 2004 at the XP conference with Carl Scotland. Um, I went for a run with Carl, I say a run, Carl ran. Matt ran, I staggered this morning. And I mentioned this to him, the fact that actually, you can tell, see from this photo, Carl is some kind of time lord, because I've changed loads, and he looks exactly the same. <laughs> I don't know really quite how that's possible. Anyway, so I did these talks, and they were kind of received, you know, some people were kind of interested, but it was a bit lukewarm. So my whole fact thing. And then, so fast forward 10 years, 10 years later, I've done my PhD, I've been a practitioner of Agile, a consultant, a coach, a trainer. In 2014, I'm in this room, this is just before the talk, Agile Cambridge. Those are real Andy Warhols. I don't know if anyone was there when I gave the talk at Agile Cambridge, maybe. Um, and I stood up, and I don't know why I did this, but I stood up, and at the beginning of the talk, I said, my son has just been diagnosed with autism. And I'd never said that in public before, and I said it, and straight afterwards, I had to kind of stop because it was really powerful, and I had to take a breath before I could carry on. And then, as if that wasn't enough, I said, and I think I might be autistic too. And there's a voice in the back of my head screaming at me the whole time going, what are you doing? This is career suicide. You're a coach, you're a trainer, you're not supposed to be flawed, you're a logic girl. Um, and yet, something amazing happened. So through doing these talks, I've connected with people in ways I never did before. Um, I've been asked to talk at more and more things. I find myself keynoting at things. So it seems like, from my sample size of one, me, um, that as an industry, we do value vulnerability. We do value turning up as your entire self. We do value diversity. And yet I'm puzzled because as an industry, we seem to be creating organizations that reward sameness. That reward conformity. And yet, as an industry, we're thirsty for creative products and creative thinking and solutions to tricky problems. So I'm puzzled. And with a bit of a nod to my two vulnerability heroes in the world, so if you haven't seen these people, I, I'm, I'm assuming most people have heard of them, but possibly you haven't, Brene Brown and Amanda Palmer. This is now the most vulnerable talk I've ever given. Um, it's going to be also the least scientific talk I've ever given. So I'm turning everything up to 11 today, and we'll see how that goes. I'll try not to cry. Um, OK, so first of all, just in case you're standing there thinking, she doesn't seem very autistic, because I get that a lot. Actually, autistic women get that a lot. We're very good at masking. We're very good at learning through rules, through mimicry, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Here are my scores on the doors. So this is the AQ test. The AQ test that was created by Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge. You can see the control group. That's the dotted line. The other group is people who are diagnosed with the autistic spectrum disorder, and this is me. Um, so that's where I am on that one. This is the RIPVO Autism Asperger Diagnostic Scale. Um, uh, the top layer at the bottom, can I do pointing with this? I think I probably can. No? OK. So the top layer here, uh, threshold values for su suspected ASD, 
Um, total overall score of 65. I scored a mammoth 155. So, um, and my sister's a clinical psychologist, and she thinks I'm probably autistic too. So, um, I think there's lots of good evidence. And let's zoom out a bit for a minute, though. So, it's still a thought experiment, in fact. I invite you, if you feel comfortable, to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine that you're just about to open the doors into a room. And you open the doors, and you're astonished when you open the doors at the collaboration that's going on in that room. Okay? You're absolutely like, whoa, that's people collaborating. What kind of things do you picture? You can open your eyes now. What kind of things are you picturing? How does it see? How does it look? How do, what, do you, what do you hear? People sitting around tables talking. People sitting around tables talking? The buzz of conversation? Post-it notes. Post notes. <laughs> Sorry? Whiteboards. Whiteboards? People standing and talking to each other? Walking to each other? Mobbing. Sorry? Mobbing. Mobbing. People high-fiving, right. And this is the mood that we've got into, right? This is how we imagine collaboration, right? And I love all that stuff. However, it's kind of a bit of a broken model of collaboration because it turns out, right, that collaboration is so much more than that. So when I think of organizational transformations that I've been involved in in the agile world, small ones and larger ones, I think of places where we've gone from having a very sterile kind of environment where people are sitting in cubicles, being quiet. We don't see people working together all that much. I see that moving into an, uh, an organisation where there's loads on the wall and everyone's really loud and all that kind of stuff, right? And I've always thought that's amazing. And it turns out my model of collaboration was a little bit broken too. And it sort of dawned on me that maybe what we're doing is replacing one monoculture with another monoculture. And that in both of those cases, we may very, very well be alienating, marginalizing, and excluding, and maybe even driving away some of the very best minds that we've got because they don't fit our collaboration model. And if you're thinking, well, that's just you know, the neurodiversity piece, it doesn't, it doesn't, work, it doesn't apply to me because I'm not autistic. As organizations transform and, and we work more across boundaries, you're working with people with different kinds of minds, even if they're not on your team. People who've chosen careers in accountancy or marketing or whatever it might be because they fit the way that they like to work, their style, their interests. Okay. And I love talking, by the way. Sometimes I call myself, in talks, I call myself a recovering talkaholic. But the one re really surprising thing that came out from my studies of pair programmers and my, all my sentences that I analysed was and this blew me away a little bit, experts talk less than, than novices. So some of the magic of being an experienced collaborator is in the quiet bits, not the noisy bits. OK. So Catherine Kirk and I have created a movement called Inclusive Collaboration. And we've done it in memory of our friend Jean Tabaker the collaboration goddess, um, to help people start thinking about the different kinds of minds that they, they encounter at work and how we can better support all the kinds of thinkers that we want on our teams. Um, so come and see us. We've got a, a stall. Um, come and talk to us. Come and start thinking about all of that good stuff. All right. Diversity in general is good. We know that. There's lots of research out here. This is Scott Page. He's done lots of work on diversity. Found that diverse teams outperform teams of experts. As long as the problem's tricky enough and the people are smart enough. And we see diversity in a little bit of a fish thing. Um, <laughs> we see diversity all the time. We see symbiotic relationships. Okay? So this is a goby, this fish, and a shrimp, and they live together in this little hole. Okay. And the goby's really good at wiggling around when somebody comes nearby and going, oh, danger, danger, be aware, be aware. And the shrimp is a really good housekeeper. It's good at burrowing and tidying the, the sand out of the hole. So they're really different, but they complement each other and work together. And we see that all, all around the world. 
And I could talk about all kinds of diversity, so, and they're all very worthy things to talk about, right? Gender diversity, um, cultural diversity, racial diversity, LGBT. Um, but at the moment, I'm focusing very firmly on neurodiversity. Neurodiversity being a word that was coined by the autism movement to say that, you know what? Different kinds of thinkers, different kinds of minds, autism, ADHD, depression, uh, dyslexia, are all just normal variations in the human genome that are around. They're not things we want to eradicate from society. They're not things that we want to cure. They're things that we want to support, embrace, and celebrate if we're going to be the best society that we could possibly be. So, um, I was lucky enough to see Temple Grandin, just so I've mentioned Temple. I was lucky enough to see Temple Grandin again uh, this year, uh, both, uh, both kind of so socially at my house, but also um, I saw her present at the National Autism Society. And pretty much my favourite sentence that she said was, if there was no autism, you better really like your computer because you're never going to get another one. <laughs> okay. So... The other reason I'm interested in neurodiversity, obviously my son's autistic, as it's pretty certain that I'm autistic too, um, is that we're an industry of thinkers. So we want to talk about diversity. I want to talk about diversity of brains, diversity of thought, diversity of thinking. And this is my more diverse diversity talk, so it's not going to be just focused on autism. And we're also going to, I'm also going to cover some practical things that you can do to start supporting neurodiversity in your teams. So, and in case you're thinking, actually, I don't have one, anybody autistic or anybody neurodiverse in my organisation, which, by the way, statistically is pretty unlikely. I'll show you some photos of some neurotypical people struggling in the environment that they're working in, okay? This is a friend of mine who um, is somewhere that I was involved in the initial um, uh, transformation of the organisation. Um, they broke down all the cubicles, it's all really bright colour, they got really great lights in, it's all really bright. She suffers from sinus issues and headaches to the extent that her team, so even in dark glasses she can't cope with the lights, and her team made her a visor out of post-it notes so she could function. Right, so I don't want to work in an environment where we have to do this. Uh, this is um, a photo that Catherine took. <laughs> of somebody struggling so hard to find a quiet place at work that they had to hide between two movable whiteboards to do their work. I don't want to work in an environment where people have to do that. Okay, so let's talk about some of the superpowers that neurodiversity brings to your teams. Let's start with autism. So, when a lot of people think about autism, they kind of think Rain Man, right? They think of savants or savants. They think of people who have these amazing abilities to do these things. Um, and one of the... And, and some folk with autism have that, and some don't. In fact, you know, generally, these are sweeping generalizations, just like neurotypical people are all different, autistic people are all different too. Um, but one of the, the things that a lot of folk, people with autism have is this kind of like obsessive specialism, special interest, special knowledge collection thing that we do. Right. Um, and this is a photo that I took at Comic-Con this year. In case you didn't think I was enough of a geek already, I go to Comic-Con. Um, and I walked past this stall and I thought, well, they're quite good photos and there's some Doctor Who's and that's lovely. Um, and then the guy who was running the stall said, oh, these are, these are pictures, actually. These are drawings that my son's done. And I'm like, wow, they're drawings. And he said, yeah, my son's autistic. And so we got talking. And he said, um, my son's autistic and he was really badly served by the education system. He was really badly served by the education to the extent that when he was 14, he just stopped going to school. Um, because it wasn't working for them, they weren't supporting him. And he shut himself away in the bedroom and drew. He taught himself to draw from scratch. And we didn't really see the drawings that he was drawing. And actually, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up when he showed me this next thing. And he said, after two years in his room, drawing, 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 he walked out with this. So clearly, I think this is somebody who does have some kind of amazing artistic ability that was in there and needed to be unleashed, but it also shows just how powerful, you know, repetitive, like, obsessive specialism can be. Why wouldn't we want that on our teams? 
And there are organizations out there, and I've spoken to three of these in the last six months or so, um, who specifically look at employing autistic people, particularly for things like uh, data cleansing and testing. So I spoke to somebody who'd worked with somebody from Specialistern and said to them, show me what you can do that's different. And the specialist and employee said, okay, so the, the autistic guy said, okay, well, show me, some, um, show me some UX standards. And he read them and absorbed them. And then he said, right, show me some pages. And he could literally go, that one's okay, that one's okay, that one's okay, that one's okay, something wrong with that one, that one's okay, that one's okay, that one's okay, that one's okay, something wrong with that one, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. And he couldn't even tell you what was wrong with the ones that were wrong because he's absorbed through this kind of intense study, the tacit knowledge of what makes things right, right and wrong, and he could pull them out, and then they'd analyze them and go, you know what, actually it's this. And the same with data cleansing. It's this ability to pick out patterns and anomalies in patterns. Okay. This is Jamie Knight. Jamie's kind of my autism and tech hero. Sometimes he watches my talks and he gets embarrassed. So, um, Jamie works at the BBC. He's the chief diversity officer and he's a programmer. He's been a, tech, he's been a dev for 10 years. He's got code on pretty much every single BBC page that you see. He's also written code that runs in space. Jamie masters autism for a long time and got poorly and has now decided that that's not what he's going to do. So he's exploring what it means to be autistically happy. This is Lion, who's Jamie's sidekick. Lion's got a job at the BBC too. He's head of um, antelope control. <laughs> he's Jamie's constant companion, and he's head of antelope control because he said he was, and everyone's a bit too scared to argue with him, to be honest. <laughs> so Jamie's a developer at the BBC. Um, he's non-verbal. He doesn't speak at the moment. He um, can't cross the road on his own because he gets very caught up with patterns like red car, red car, blue car, red car, blue car, and forgets to look where he's going. Um, and he wears a squeezy vest. So you see this vest that he's wearing with a little thing? That's inflatable because one of the issues he has is with his proprioceptive system. And sometimes he forgets, not just forgets what shape his body is, but forgets that he has a shape at all. And he says it's like all the atoms in his body dispersing. And so he can pump up his squeezy vest and it applies pressure to his body to remind him that he has a shape. Okay. And he's an incredibly talented developer. In fact, he's hacked his flat a little bit so that he can press on his phone when he's having a panic attack and have all the lights dimmed. He's change the fire alarm system so that the noise doesn't freak him out too much because it's loud and it kind of in a very calm voice says, Jamie, there's an issue. You need to get help and try and leave. And messages all his friends. So he's got a really tight circle of supportive friends that he calls the herders. So that's Jamie. You can follow him uh, on Twitter, Jamie and Lion, or both separately. Lion's got his own Twitter account too. Um, and, uh, and he blogs about how he's doing in this journey where he's considering what it means to be autistically happy. All right, so that's autism, ADHD. If you think autism is prevalent, so one in 68 people, they reckon at the moment, is autistic. If we think autism is prevalent, then ADHD or ADD, because you don't have to have the hyperactivity part, um, three to 4% of adults in the UK have some form of ADD or ADHD. And when we think about ADHD, we think, tend to think about People who find it really hard to um, filter out things in the environment. Right? So people who are kind of like need a quiet space. And when I say quiet, I'm not thinking about just um, um, oral, um, aural. I'm thinking about quiet spaces to see as well. There was a thing recently where people with um, ADHD were asked to explain what it was like to have ADHD. Um, and my favorite of those quotes was somebody who said, it's like having a hundred browser windows open and that you're trying to do something different in every single one of them. And then somebody comes up and tries to talk to you. That's what it feels like. But what we don't often realize is with ADHD comes superpowers too. So people with ADHD are really, really good at tangential thinking, about taking something and going off in a completely different direction. Okay. And people with ADHD can do this fantastic thing called hyperfocus. Okay. It has to be something they're interested in. 
but they can focus in for prolonged period of time, periods of time, far beyond what your neurotypical person can do. Okay, to the extent where sometimes, you know, that thing where you forget to eat or you kind of look up and think, oh, I'm hungry and it's night time, that kind of focus. And they can pick up on peripheral details around that other people might not see. So I took to asking people um, in our community that I know have some neurodiversity about how, what they think that brought to their job. And somebody who's a pretty eminent agile coach said to me, the skills I've developed in living with ADHD have created coaching superpowers for me um, and increased my intuition hugely. And I guess that's because that person's picking up on peripheral stuff that to the rest of us might just go unnoticed. Okay. My son has a side order of ADHD with his autism. Bipolar disorder. I say that so I can say the next thing, which is, my mother has bipolar disorder. Is my family sounding a bit dysfunctional by now? Um, so my mother's had bipolar disorder pretty much my whole life, since I was about eight. Um, and bipolar disorder is um, characterized by extreme moods, uh, extreme kind of mood swings. And they can be fast cycling or slow cycling. So if you imagine that most of us kind of, you know, some days we're happier, some days we're sadder. With bipolar disorder, that swings right to the extremes. Um, my mum's a slow cyclist. She's in a hypermanic phase at the moment. It'll probably go on for a number of months. Um, I did say this was going to be a vulnerable talk, right? <laughs> uh, for, a, for a number of months. And when people with, with bipolar disorder, and I'm going to talk about the depression as a, as, a, as, a, as a separate slide, but when people with bipolar disorder are in the hypermanic phase, they've got so much energy, so much energy that they kind of don't need to sleep very much, if at all. Um, they have racing thoughts. They're quite extravagant. Um, and they've got a lack of concern for the usual social constraints. So my mum, when she's um, hypermanic, might wake up one day and think, I'm feeling a lot of affinity with the colour green today, so I'm going to wear green. Um, uh, I'm going to only eat green food. Um, I'm not going to talk to anybody if they're not wearing green. Uh, it was blue recently, actually, and she even went as far as dyeing her hair blue. So there you go. Um, so, so there's this kind of like intense focus on, on feeling aligned with, with something. And one of the other interesting things that my mum and a lot of other people with bi bipolar disorder do is this thing called clanging. Clanging's like super fast word association. Super, super fast. So fast that your neurotypical person can't really follow it at all, which is incredibly frustrating for the person who's bipolar. They're like, why can't you keep up? What's the matter with you? Um, so I asked somebody, again, somebody very eminent in our industry who has bipolar disorder, how they thought it helped them in their work. And they said, I quote, when I'm in my manic state, my mental filters are degraded. And that means that I'm less judgmental and I can recognize patterns that I otherwise wouldn't identify. I understand the value of seemingly unrelated ideas to help solve problems that I'm struggling with. And rather than immediately trust patterns as absolute truth, I just use them as potential ideas and I test them out. And now that I'm practice, practiced at spotting potential patterns, I no longer even need to be in a manic state to do so. Okay, so bipolar disorder has superpowers too. Ah, there's my bus. There's my bus. It doesn't look like that now. It's been sandblasted and it looks grey and I'm feeling a bit sad that I did that to it because it's got full of character here. There's a reason this bus is on the slide about depression. We'll get to that in a minute. So depression, right? So if we think autism looks prevalent, if we think ADHD looks prevalent, if we think bipolar disorder looks prevalent, <gasps> wow, depression, right? 20% of adults in the UK have experienced a significant depressive episode in their lives. That's a lot, right? So somebody you or somebody you've worked with for sure will have been or be at the moment having a depressive episode, I guess. Um, and one of the really interesting superpowers about depression, depression is the story about driving. So there's lots of research um, about depression. And my favorite piece is that if you ask, so if you ask neurotypical people, if you ask a control group, right, how good are you at driving your car? How, do you th where do you think you are on the kind of 0 to 100% of how good you could possibly be at driving, right? Almost everybody puts themselves in the top 50%. Statistically, that's not possible, right? Everybody can't be better than average. It's just 
impossible. In fact, you ask Americans, well, there was a study done in America, 93% of US subjects put themselves in the top 50% for driving skills. 93% people think they're better than average, cool. Um, and, and if that's not extreme enough for you, um, there was a study by Preston and Harris, this is quite an old study, where they even targeted people who were in hospital because of driving accidents that they'd said were their own faults, they'd admitted fault for, and I don't know if I have the percentage. More than 50% more than of people, I don't have a percentage written down here, but, but, but more than 50% of even those people thought they were in the top 50% of drivers. <laughs> right. And there's one group that weren't like that. There's one group that had a really balanced view of reality and their own abilities, and that one group were the clinically depressed. So maybe we're all just running through life, people who don't have depression, with this kind of overly rosy view of what's going to happen. So I want that on my team, realism. Sensory processing disorders. OK. So alongside autism or ADHD or whatever, or separately to it, you can have this completely on its own. And I talked about this a little bit last year, too. You can have sensory processing disorder. So any of your senses can be under or over calibrated. Okay. So maybe I'm over or under sensitive to sound. Do you know what this squeaking? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. To touch. I'm not great with the... Actually, it's not too bad today, but sometimes I can feel the mic lead the whole time I'm talking. Um, and then, uh, or to taste, or to smell, or whatever. Um, and the other two that people don't talk about so much are proprioceptive system, like Jamie. I'm not quite sure where my body is in space right now. Um, and the vestibular system. So my sense of balance is out of whack a little bit. I could get vertigo or whatever. And sometimes people with an under-sensitive vestibular system need to stimulate their body's feeling of balance by moving around a lot. Okay, like, you know people who kind of rock on their chair or whatever? Sometimes they're just stimulating the vestibular system. Okay, and yet we create environments like this. Okay, and I look like I was one of the, let's tear down the cubicles and all collaborate crew. But I think we're moving past that now and realizing that we've got to op offer people options. Okay, so a couple of things that I'm doing at the moment, the practical bit. So Catherine and I have started the inclusive collaboration movement or campaign. Uh, we have a number of people that are ambassadors for us too, and we're aiming to raise awareness of how to make our collaboration more inclusive for all different kinds of minds and all different kinds of people. And that doesn't necessarily just mean folk with autism, folk with ADHD or whatever. Also, maybe people are a little bit more introverted or extroverted, uh, people who um, need to think things through really carefully in advance of coming up with a solution. And then people who like to just, you know, go, let's go with this and try it out and see what, it happens, see what happens. How do we embrace all of those kinds of people? and support them, because we know diversity is a good thing. And I'm going to give you a few practical tips, too. So here is uh, something that most of us, I guess, probably already do. Here's a Kanban board, well, kind of a scrum board, really. And here is a visual timetable for an autistic child. They look kind of similar, right? They look kind of similar. Um, and for somebody with with autism, that's really good, because I can see surety about what I'm doing now, what I'm working on next, where we are in the process of getting things completed in a visual form that really works for me. So one of the things we know, or, or, or we're starting to think we know and explore a little bit more, is the fact that there seems to be a link between autism and tech, and the types of autistic minds that we have in tech tend to be visuospatial thinkers. So tend to be really good at where things are in space and tend to work really well with things like modeling maps. <laughs> so producing visual representations of things are really, can be really, really helpful. And 
My preference now is to even augment those. So in the amazing keynote yesterday, did you, did you like the map or the written text? And we all went, the map? Actually, I was thinking both. I like both. That's what I want to present to people. The option. Have the map, because you're probably a visual thinker, because you're in IT, right? But have the text as well, because maybe you like the linear text detail stuff. So let's provide people with options. So this is, again, for an autistic child. Um, in our teams, we can create uh, working agreements. How are we going to work together as a team? So this is an example of how that looks for an autistic child. So we've got things like, I can be polite and respectful. I can tell someone how I'm feeling. I never scream, run away, spit, have a tantrum, or hit or kick others. Hopefully, you don't need that in your meetings. Right? <laughs> but you may well benefit from having some really clear, delineated, oh, there's that word again. I have to be careful about that. Um, some really clear rules about how we agree that we're going to work together that we're all comfortable with. And this is the output. I've written it back up so it's nice and tidy. Um, but this is the output from a workshop that Diana Larson did at um, XP this year. And she kind of gave it a neuro neurodiversity spin for me, which is very kind. Um, and these are simple rules for neuroinclusivity. So this is... Um, this is an exercise on creating simple rules on how we're going to be more inclusive. And this is just what the group came up with. Don't take these rules and say, Sal said, these have to be the rules for our team. We will have them and embrace them. The whole point is you make your own rules up that are appropriate for your team. Okay? But these are just examples. Empathise before judging. Here's my favourite. Assume positive intent. Right? Because I really don't believe, and then this kind of goes back a little bit to Alex's uh, session yesterday, I really don't believe anybody really gets up in the morning and thinks, how can I be a pain in the arse and crap at my job today? <laughs> I really don't. It might seem like people do, right? Because we can't understand their behaviour and everything that's going on in their lives, but I don't think they do. So if we assume positive intent, then that will help. Meetings. These are, I think, the most beautiful creatures in the whole world, hammerheads. And sometimes it feels like this when you walk into a meeting, right? There are all the sharks. <laughs> so there's loads of stuff we can do in our meetings to help. We can keep them really structured. We can have them in the same, same time and place every time. We can circulate a list of attendees and an agenda so that there's a lot of surety. We're, minimizing the unknowns. One thing that we can definitely do is we can offer people the ability to contribute to the session in advance by telling them what we're going to be thinking about in case there are people who like to think things through, by offering them the opportunity to forward information to us in advance of the meeting so that they can contribute by maybe emailing us or leaving something on our desk for us to take along and contribute on their behalf. And for certain, we can come out with nice, concise actions that are very obvious. So some people will find it incredibly hard to scan a great big document of meeting minutes. We can capitalise on and expand upon people's specialisms. So this artist, imagine, they go home, they start immersing themselves in drawing. Dad goes, well, that drawing stuff's all very well, but you know what, you need to get out and do other things as well and broaden. And, um, and they just really want to be immersed in this specialism. So the trick that we learn as autistic parents is to, to expand specialisms gently, to say, hey, you're interested in drawing, why don't we go outside and draw a house? And to, and to sort of expand from there. But also to capitalise upon these specialisms. So I spoke to somebody last year, a friend of mine, who's a, a, a manager of a, a, an IT department. He had somebody in the department, who they're pretty sure had Asperger's, who is absolutely obsessed with coding standards. Right? He had their coding standards all memorised. And I did this once with a document. It wasn't coding standards, but I, I kind of relate to this. Um, had the coding standards all memorised. And whenever they had a meeting or they did a code review, he'd be like, oh, no, but you see that line there? It contravenes standard number 3.1.2.6.4, um, so we need to change it. And the rest of the team would be like, really, you know. 
Um, and my friend, the managers, rather than say, just get over the coding standard thing and you know, focus on something else, when your interest in coding standards are really interesting, why don't you create a community of practice around coding standards? Why don't we make you the person who trains new starters on the coding standards when they come into the company? So took the specialist interest and went, oh, brilliant, how can we make the most of that interest? How can we point that at the right area? Provide multimodal information. Some folks love text. Some people not so much. There's a great story um, about Richard Branson, actually, who's well-known dyslexic. Like you probably heard of Richard Branson, right? Um, who said his dyslexia helped him uh, because he couldn't read all the reports that people sent, sent him. Like, I've got this business idea. Here's a 30-page document. Boom. And he'd go, OK. So he got really good at scanning and making a gut, gut decision. And he's like, I got such amazing business intuition through just not being able to read through all the details of documents. I had to be like, let the big things jump out and then decide based on that. I'm proud of this slide. <laughs> I'm not a very succinct person. So be succinct. I had to train my son's teacher to be succinct. So she does this. Zach, can you go and get your bag? He doesn't do it. Zach, can you go and get your bag because you need it to take home? Doesn't do it. Zach, can you go and get your bag because you need it to take home with your homework in, otherwise you'll forget to do your homework? He doesn't do it. Zach, can you go and get your bag because you need it to take home with your homework in, and if you don't do your homework, you're going to have to do it in break time tomorrow and you won't have time to read the book that you're reading. Okay, so you see what she's done is every time he hasn't attended to her, she's added a bit more information, added a bit more information, added a bit more information, trying to make her case more strongly to him about what he wants to do. Here's how he functions, right? Um, and you can think of it as, 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 as kind of like runs through a compiler in a way. First time, that can get back. Here's a noise. Right? Second time, here's a noise, thinks that's somebody talking. Third time, hears a noise, looks up, someone's talking, thinks, oh, they're talking to me. Fourth time, actually starts listening. By now, the sentence is so long, he can't pass it. Okay. So what we've had to train his teacher to do is the opposite. And here's how it goes in our house in the morning, and I'm, I'm thinking for quite a lot of your houses, if you've got kids, probably sound like this too. Zach, um, it's time to go to school. You need to put your shoes on. Zach, it's time to put your shoes on. Zach, shoes on. Shoes? Honey, shoes, shoes, <laughs> shoes, and eventually the shoes, shoes go on because I've taken information away every single time. And because I know that that's the way he functions, I can do that without ever getting to, well, I say ever, I'm, you know, <laughs> to that, will you just put your shoes on? <laughs> Moment. Yeah, sorry, I'm not perfect. <laughs> um. <laughs> so be succinct. Uh, does anyone know what piece of music this is? Four minutes, Yay! Four Minutes 33 by John Cage, okay. You will notice there are no notes in this piece, but there's a flat. I like that he did that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that he did that. I've seen people perform this piece. Has anyone been to a performance of Four Minutes 33? Yes! Nice. When I went, um, between the movements, the violinist went to pits. I didn't do anything. That was great. <laughs> so, um, I put this up because pacing and breaks are really important when you're interacting with people. When I studied expert pair programmers and everyone said, we exclusively pair. That's all we do. We always work, work in pairs. Nobody paired from 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock at night and then went home. It's exhausting. Even if you're neurotypical, it's exhausting. One of the positive benefits of pair working is you don't get distracted, right? You stay on task because you don't, like, go check your email or look something up on the internet or, you know, take as many breaks or whatever. And actually what I found was people do take breaks all the time. They need that rhythm to the way that they work together so that they can incubate ideas so that they don't get exhausted with the interaction. 
So build in breaks, build in quiet, build in recovery time. And recently, um, when I gave a talk about this, somebody in the audience went, oh! And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they said, uh, I've just realized in our breakout areas, we've only got collaborative things that people can do, like table tennis and football and stuff. <laughs> like, we don't have anything that people do solitary. So we're not giving people a break from collaborating. After a day at the conference, or sometimes after a morning, I need sometimes need to go to lie down in a room for a little bit and just not speak to people. OK. Provide structure where there isn't any. This has got washing up here because I don't do well in free-form social um, situations. I'm not very good in parties. I'm okay if I'm sat with a, a few people that I know really well. I don't really understand the rules, like when can I start a side conversation? When can I leave a conversation or join a new one without being rude? I don't, and it's usually noisy and it's a bit bewildering for me. But if you give me a structured activity, I'm good, right? Which is why at parties or whatever, quite often I'll do the washing up or tidy the cups away or serve drinks to people. And everyone's like, why is she serving the drinks? Like, it's structure, it's all good, I can do this. I don't really need to make eye contact with too many people and I know what the rules are. Okay, so providing rules is providing rules, providing structured activities that people can focus on is really good. Being sensitive to prolonged eye contact. There's an autistic um, journalist called Dean Beadle who talks about, about autism a fair amount. Um, and he says, why would you, why would you try and have a difficult conversation with someone with autism straight in front of them? There's a reason why people with autism who want to talk about different subjects will probably come up to you when you're doing something like washing up or driving a car because you can't make prolonged eye contact. So I offer you as an experiment, next time you need to have a conversation with somebody, maybe not even a tricky one, go for a walk with them. So they've got an excuse to attend to looking where they're going rather than look you in the face the whole time and see how that feels. So these spaces, these continually busy, noisy, one-size-fits-all spaces aren't great for everybody. We need to provide quiet spaces. We need to provide options for people. Some people will thrive. Some people will wither. We need to provide options. We need to learn to be OK with silence. Jean Tabaker taught me a little trick about silence that I use all the time, um, which is to count to 10 behind my back when I ask a question of people, because I'm not very good with silence. So I tend to ask a question, and then if you don't answer in the first two seconds, I answer for you, because I'm uncomfortable with the quiet. So now I answer the ask the question and then go, one, two, three, four, five. And I can hear James' voice saying to me, by the time you get to eight, someone will feel more uncomfortable than you do, and they'll talk. <laughs> and she's right, they do, every time. So fake it, count to ten. And Catherine and I are going to uh, be running a workshop tomorrow to help people explore the quiet side of collaboration. Um, and we're calling it the science experiment. Back up my t-shirt. I've gone all quiet because I'm really excited about it. That's kind of the reverse of what people normally do. Um, so we're going to do an activity where most of the session is going to be entirely in silence so that you can explore collaborating in silence and then we're going to reflect upon it afterwards. And the reason I'm really, really excited about it is we're not going to tell you what the activity is in advance, but it's fabulous. It's properly fabulous. And it's an activity I've been wanting to do for four years and finally have the opportunity to do it. So it's an activity that I heard about when I had my youngest child, who's now five. I took a year off. I went traveling. I was driving a massive RV in Australia, and a voice came on the radio, and it was a guy talking about this charitable thing that he'd set up where he'd provide boxes for people to make something for people who needed them to use. <laughs> Gosh! <laughs> I don't know how to go tell you any more about it, really, without saying what it is. Um, so the reason I decided that this is the place to do that is, first of all, I love you all, and this is a great conference, um, but also um, because I wanted a non-trivial activity. So I thought, we could make Lego in silence. I've done that before at workshops with some of the people here. We've done Lego building silently. 
But that might not feel like something you could be quite as invested in, although to be fair, you all were quite invested in the Lego, um, as, as something non-trivial and meaningful. So this is making something real for people who, that, who will actually be using them. Um, and there's only 30 spaces, so that's what I wanted to tell you. So if you do want to come, you probably want to get there early. Or maybe not, maybe 10 people will turn up and I can make the rest. <laughs> it's all good. Okay, my final bit of vulnerability for today. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> I kind of wrote a book. Well, hmm. <laughs> uh, Catherine encouraged me to get something out there into the world to help people start thinking about all this stuff. Um, this was how long ago? Three and a half weeks ago? Four weeks ago. Catherine said, yeah, I think you should get a book out by LA, by Lean Agile Scotland. <laughs> right. Um, and I only had the time after 9 p.m. most days as well, because I was parenting and working. Uh, so I took all of my ego out of the book that I thought I was going to write. So this isn't a book of research and description and um, rich prose and all that kind of stuff. This is an absolutely minimum viable product. Have you got one down there so, so I can prove how draft it is? Um, it's quite draft. <laughs> um, book of experiments. Little thought experiments for you to do to start thinking in your teams and in your organizations about um, inclusive collaboration. And it's free. That's how much I want you to be thinking about this stuff. It's free. I, bought, I paid for 50 to be printed out there at the stall in the copy area that's got inclusive collaboration up. Um, if you don't get one, um, it's on LeanPub as well. Um, it will remain free for at least the next six months or so. Um, I hope it's free forever. We'll see how that goes, because we might need some funding to do more stuff and campaigning later. So you can pay what you want for it on LeanPub if you do decide you want to contribute towards our movement. So that's the book. And one last fish slide, and I'm done. So here's a coral reef. It's pretty diverse. When I, in my studies, just applied a lens of distributed cognition, to Agile teams, what I found was that they're a rich ecosystem. They're a rich ecosystem of different people working together with tools, with artifacts, with common language, with particular kinds of environments that work for them. And that diversity and that ecosystem, ecosystem is what makes them wonderful. And so, as a kind of parting thing. We're all individuals, we're all different, we're all lots of components, but if we can support each other properly, we can make beautiful ecosystems like this. Thank you.